everyone. This is Mallory, Director of Marketing at MStoner, and I'm really excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Small Project, Small Team, Big Impact. So I just want to do a quick audio check to make sure that you can hear me. If a couple people could use the raise your hand feature or tweet me or send me a chat. There's 3,000 ways with technology to get in touch with me to let me know that you can actually hear me. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Thank you, Libby, Meg, Sarah, everyone for raising your hand. Fantastic. So let's move into a few housekeeping items before I introduce our presenter. Uh, first of all, as always, today's webinar is recorded. So within a few days, you'll actually receive an email with a link to view the recording in case you want to look over any of the information that Fran presents today. You can also share the link with your colleague or if they were unable to attend the webinar, tweet it out, uh, do whatever you like with that link. Second, our next webinar is called Inspired by the Cheshire Cat Strategy Leads to Success. So it is another webinar focused on web strategy. And that will be led by Susan Evans on Monday, March 25th at 2 p.m. So what we'll do is include a sign-up link in our email to you with the webinar recording. So if you'd like to attend that webinar too, you can easily register for it. Third, if you are in the Boston area, please listen up. We have a really exciting uh, book launch and signing event on February 26th at Boston University. Eric Stoller and Michael Stoner will be having a conversation about how colleges and universities can use social media as an effective component for recruiting, fundraising, awareness raising, et cetera, and, and social media campaigns. And so this is around the launch of our book, Social Works, how higher ed uses social social media to raise money, build awareness, recruit students, and get results. And that's going to be published on Monday, February 25th. This conversation is taking place on February 26th at 6.30 p.m., like I said, at BU. So there's more information on the M. Stoner blog. So just go to mstoner.com. But if you are in the Boston area, we'd definitely love to see you at that event. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so finally, during the webinar, you can use the chat feature to ask questions. And what we'll do is save about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. So if we don't get to your question, uh, what Fran will do is follow up with an answer on the M. Stoner blog later this week or early next week. But you can also join me and ask questions in the back channel using the hashtag BigIdeasHE. And you can actually find that in the chat uh, portion of your GoToWebinar control panel. Zablocki, he's a strategist at M. Stoner where he works with education institutions around the world to help them realize their strategic web communications goals. Before M. Stoner, Fran worked for nine years in many different areas of higher ed, including marketing and student affairs at Nazareth College, alumni at SUNY Geneseo and admissions for SUNY Buffalo. So he is uh, well prepared to talk to us today about small projects, small teams, and making a big impact. So Fran, we're really excited that you're here for this, and I'm going to turn this session over to you. Let's get started. Awesome. Thanks, Mallory. I am also excited to be here. Thanks, everyone, for joining me today. Um, as Mallory mentioned, I've been part of or led many different small projects in higher education. So that is going to be, today is going to be a talk about all the different tips and tricks and tools I have found useful over the years and some that uh, I've found even in the last couple of weeks that have been really good. So uh, small projects, small teams, being successful in both of those cases is the name of the game. And as Mallory mentioned, the hashtag is Big Ideas HE. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Zablocki. I'll reintroduce myself again. Hello, I'm a strategist at M. Stoner, and I'm going to be talking about small projects. But first, before we get into talking about small projects, I think it's important to make the distinction what I mean by small projects. So what, what is a big project versus a small project? Uh, M. Stoner has done more big institutional redesign and relaunch projects than anyone else uh, in the world, and we're very good at them, but this isn't 
this isn't a presentation about those types of projects specifically. Those types of projects tend to be the 500 pound gorilla projects with characteristics such as a 10 to 14 month lifespan, uh, basically take over your life. Anyone who's done a major web relaunch, take over your life for like the last three months. Everything else, clear the decks and basically work on just that project. So it owns your world entirely, but then conveniently leaves for like three to five years so that everyone can just relax, right? Mm, not quite. Because in the meantime, in those years between and what has been building up while you've been doing that major web relaunch are all the small projects, also known as hordes of 10 pound monkeys. So what do I mean by small projects? What kind of examples can we give here? Well, uh, a small project could be an admission microsite, uh, could be a site for a specific professional school. A lot of times it's a site that exists uh, only for a limited period of time, such as a campus anniversary site. And really it can be any of those sites that come to be when someone walks into your office and says, hey, I need a website. Or, oh, you didn't know about that website? Which I'm sure never happens to any of you. So what do we do with all of these 10 pound monkeys jumping on our, all over our backs? Do we take them on all at the same time? Do we pick the lightest ones off first? Do we shock them with an electrified t-shirt? Or do we tackle them with lean, mean processes, tools, and communication? I think the answer is obvious. And why are we going to do this? Because you don't have an unlimited amount of time. You need to get things done as quickly as possible within reason. You also aren't minting money, and so you need to do something that's going to be budget effective. And you probably don't have nearly as many people as you'd like to have to do these types of projects. And maybe it is just you alone doing these types of projects. And so that's just, here's a shout out to Higher Ed Solo for all those who are out there doing all the work themselves. I think you'll find some really useful tips and tricks and tools in here. Um, I'm sure everyone will, but uh, in particular, this is targeted for those small web teams and maybe even web teams of one. So how are we going to do this? We are going to take the project life cycle, look at each aspect of it, and trim the fat. So how, what kind of approach does trimming the fat take? Well, basically, I want to make everything lean. We want to make lean processes. We want to look at lean tools. We want to look at taking our communications methods and making those lean as well. And lastly, we're going to take a look at a lean platform that we feel is a really good solution. <clears throat> Excuse me. So lean means having the right tools, collaborating as much as possible, centralizing all of our documentation, and just generally being smart with time. And as I said, I'm going to break this down basically by the project life cycle. So the project life cycle is strategy, planning, creative, implementation, and, evalu and evaluation. And you'll see this nice little color-coded guide will let you know at any given point of this presentation where you are um, later on. And I've also got a couple icons just to make it clear what we're looking at at any given time. Uh, tools, process, communication, be a visual indicator for everybody. All right, well, let's get started with strategy. Strategy being the first part of any project, and the first part of strategy, in my opinion, and one thing that can save you the most time, mainly because it can prevent you from doing a bad project at all, is portfolio management. So really, the first question you should ask, whether this is a project that you guys have come up with yourselves, or whether this is a request that's come across your desk, is, does this project actually need to happen? I think it's easy to just try to put out flyers and assume that every project has to happen simply because you're being asked to do it. And sometimes, depending on who's asking, you really do have to do it. But it always helps to figure out if it actually needs to happen. So ask yourselves a few simple questions. Does this mean a need? Do we actually have the time, budget, and resources to make this happen? And if we do have the capacity to make it happen, do we actually have those resources now? And do we have the time now? Or is this something that will need to happen later? Be realistic with yourselves. Because honestly, saying yes when the answer really is no is not going to do any favors to anybody later on down the road. Um, so basically, this is like the very first piece.
to making sure that you are being lean. It's to cut the fat out of the project portfolio before it even starts. Make more time for the right projects by never starting the wrong ones. And ultimately, the goal is to become more proactive and less reactive. And I know a lot of people in smaller teams in higher education, it probably feels like you're just bombarded constantly with project requests to the point where you're not even thinking about proactively what needs to be done because you're simply trying to react and get the things that have been asked of you done. And so trying to flip that on its head and make sure you can start thinking about the strategic aspect of each project and being more proactive is a really, really important way to make the process more lean. Strategy is also one of those phases that is really, really easy to skip over if you don't want to take a lot of time. So you really are under a lot of time pressures most of the time. And so it's like, okay, let's just go. Basically step one is create stuff as opposed to let's ask whether we need to do it and let's plan it out. So, oh my God, can we just get this project done already is a really, really natural reaction, but it's the wrong reaction. Make sure to give yourself time to think as well at the beginning of the project. Now, I am going to tell you a little secret because that, that the people at Geneseo, if, if they ever find out about this, will probably laugh and, and probably nod their heads because when I had to start a major, or when I had to start a, a project for the new alumni website at Geneseo, my office was an open office and there was a lot of talk and a lot of chatter and I just needed time to think. So I actually took my schedule and scheduled meetings with myself. Yes, just with myself in the library where no one else was and labeled it on that calendar as something really important so that people would know that I was going to be busy and I was not going to be there. A little bit devious, yes, but it was time that I well spent that I needed to really think through the project. So whether it's just you or whether it's a few people um, that you work with, just getting away from the daily grind of things can be in and of itself a huge, huge time saver later on down the road to give yourself time to do strategy right. So what should you be doing when you <laughs> are in these secret meetings that you've scheduled with yourself? Well, one of the first things you want to do is create a need, want, and wish grid. This is to help to contain scope. So identify what must be included in this project and what can wait. Um, it's a really, really useful thing, and I don't even have a diagram in this because it's so simple. It's really just a grid that says need, want, wish on different columns and allows you to kind of place the different features and, and requirements of this particular project in a very simple format very quickly. And it's a good way to channel those creative yet distracting ideas that people have during these brainstorming sessions and put them someplace useful and make the people who have the ideas uh, in the first place feel like their idea is being considered without necessarily including it in the initial scope. So that's one process that works. Another, and this is something that I'm sure you've heard of before, is just to set measurable goals. And I'm borrowing this uh, actually from Mallory Wood, uh, because she is all about measurable goals. Um, but the important thing is to have goals, but not get paralyzed by the details. It can be really hard to set those goals if you don't have metrics from the past. But the most important thing is to just get beyond that paralysis and just pick a number and shoot for it. If it's not the right number, you'll find out later on down the road and you can adjust it. But aiming or having something to aim for in and of itself is a really, really worthy, uh, worthwhile thing to do. So examples of measurable, measurable goals, um, and these are just a few. This would be, you know, reach X number of people on Facebook or increase engagement by a certain percentage, drive a certain number of people to the website, prompt a certain number of people to inquire, get X number of people to apply, attract as many views of a YouTube video. And the nice thing about this is you pick a number and if you hit it really, really quickly, come in way, way, way shy, not so great, but you know more, uh, you have a better idea of what's realistic the next time you do a project. All right, so another technique that's really useful and people roll their eyes at this because this is a very, very typical business speak type of deliverable and that is the SWOT analysis, but I find that it really is a very, very effective way 
to get your ideas out quickly and on paper and figure out at before the project's even started what the strengths of the project are, the weaknesses, what opportunities this presents, and what threats. And you can take this and look at it through a couple of different lenses. You can look at it, uh, do SWAT for the project itself, or you can do SWAT for your team in the context of the project. So, you know, here's a project that requires a lot of design work. Looking at your team through SWAT, you say, well, our strengths really are more, we're more of a development shop. So let's, you know, figure out where we might be shy on things and then come back and say, okay, we can do this project or we can't because we, you know, have this talent in-house or we need X, Y, Z in order to be successful. And ultimately for strategy, a lean way of getting all of this in one place after you've gone through is to just put it all into one document and try to keep it really short. Um, two to five pages in length, make a business case, uh, kind of an executive summary at the top, identify the, goal, the main goals, that you, uh, the measurable goals that you've, um, you want to achieve with the project, include the need, want, and wish grid, and include the SWOT analysis. And really, it sounds like a lot, but it is something that all this stuff can really fit on a, on a short, brief five-pager. And it's something that you can take with you at the beginning of the project and show to the higher-ups who may or may not be approving things and be giving you a budget for this, um, that they're going to appreciate because it's going to be short and sweet and it's going to be something they, they can digest really quickly. All right, so that's strategy. Next step, planning. Planning is hard, particularly if you don't have history on how long things take. Again, I'm assuming, like, uh, I'm assuming on behalf of you, because this is something that happened to me quite a bit, that you may not have the historical information you need to make really, really fine-tuned estimates, and that's okay. That's just the reality of things. But, again, be conservative and take your best guess. Like, just, it's better to have a plan, even if it's not a perfect one, that you can adjust later on, than to just get frozen kind of with paralysis because you're not sure how long things are going to take. So break through that paralysis and get to planning. All right, so one technique with planning is to just begin at the end. Where do you want to be? What do you want to go? Where do you want to end up? So we want to have, you know, this new admissions microsite. Okay, great. Well, what does that involve? Right before we launch that site. Okay, this needs to happen. Well, what has to happen before that? And back your backfill your entire project plan with what needs to happen prior to the end all the way back to where you are now, which is the planning stage, that can help to catch stuff that isn't necessarily obvious when you think forward, uh, think forward from today on and say, well, what do we need to do? So it's just a kind of a way of flipping your brain around and thinking about things in a different way so that you can um, figure out what kind of dependencies you have in the project. And dependencies are really important if you're doing any kind of project management because those allow you to basically say, okay, we can't start X until we finished Y. Um, all right, so let's see, planning. What other stuff can you do with planning? Well, it's really, really important to identify the resources, roles, and responsibilities that you're going to need for the project up front. Uh, it's probably going to be impossible to predict it perfectly, but it's really great to at least write it down. Uh, it's also really a great idea to use collaborative tools to help save time. And as, as scary and crazy as it might sound, it can, it can be really useful to track your time, even if it is a really rough estimate. For those of you who haven't tracked time before, it may seem daunting. I didn't track time until I started working at MStoner. And it can be a little bit tedious at times, but I have to admit that it really, really helps to know exactly what I did for a week, because then I can tell somebody, honestly, this is how long it's going to take me the next time I do it which is really helpful. All right, so this is, that's planning. Here's some tools that I used or have used for planning that are relatively cheap and or free um, that you can use with your small teams uh, in your small projects. So one that I really love is Smartsheet. It's a browser-based project and resource planning um, tool, and it's collaborative, so you can share it out with people. You can have a whole bunch of people looking at it at the same time. Uh, it has built-in commenting and discussions. Um, it's always current, which is, which is one of the main things about a lot of these tools that I'm going to talk about today, is using the cloud and using 
collaborative documentation means never having to worry that you're not on the right version of the document and that alone actually saves tons and tons of time you're not going back and forth saying wait I've got version 2.1 you've got version 2.1 a oh he's got version 2.1 C oh we've got to figure this out I mean it's unbelievable how much time gets wasted just trying to figure out what the most current version of the document is so that's a little bit of an aside for all this stuff but Smartsheet in particular is really good for project planning in that respect so it's compatible with all the outside all the major outside project planning software it is about a hundred and sixty dollars a year for a team to use and you can get about 15 projects out of that um, I just really really think it's a great tool and if, and if you notice on this next slide you can kind of see how it plays out um, those predecessors we talked about earlier are all built into this and so you can kind of take each step and, and assign predecessors to them and you know the, that one little skinny column that you see there which is cut off a little bit um, called duration is basically saying here's how many business days we think this is going to take so you don't actually even have to go and like page through a calendar looking for everything you can just pick a date and say it's going to take us 15 business days and it automatically calculates it for you and over on the right hand side you can see that if you want to take a visual look at a Gantt chart format it will automatically create that for you too so it's really really good um, if $150 is too much, there are other options out there. Ganter is a really, really good program. Not quite as robust as Smartsheet, but it is free and it is collaborative cloud scheduling and project management. Has a good integration with Google Drive, um, <clears throat> and it has very similar fe uh, features to Smartsheet. In fact, here's a screenshot of Ganter right here. All right, so that's project planning and project management tools. Another thing that we find really useful that I, I, I mentioned a couple slides ago is that responsibilities list. So this outlines the roles and responsibilities for the project team. So it could just be one column, could be just what your team is doing, but if you're going to be working with other teams, and in particular if you're a creative team that's working with a technical team, this can be really good to get out of the way right away. Uh, so map, you can map it to a position, such as developer or an individual, such as John the developer, either way works. Uh, it really helps to set expectations individually for everybody. So here's an example of one of these that we have used in the past. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have the M. Stoner team, and on the right-hand side, we have the institutions team. And it can be really helpful because a lot of times you're using similar titles too. So like we have writers, you may have writers. We have technical leads, you might have a technical lead, but making the distinction on a simple grid between what our developers are going to do and what your developers are going to do right from the outset can be a really, really uh, big advantage and can help to alleviate a lot of confusion later on down the road. All right, I mentioned time tracking. And time tracking is something that, again, could be scary. But if you're having trouble estimating, it can, this can help. I find that the simpler the time tracking tool, the better. And one of the simplest and easiest to use is and, most, and least intrusive one that I've, that I've run into is called Toggle. Toggle literally, once you set it up initially, you just type in, what am, you type in what you're doing and you hit start. And then when you start something else, you type that in and hit start. And it automatically stops the last thing. And it automatically adds everything up and gives you an idea for what you did. And it starts to add, and you can see on the right hand side, it starts to add up by week, similar tasks, so you can figure out what you've been doing. And it's actually not altogether too difficult. You're just really hitting, you're hitting a toggle button, which is the name of the, you know, one of the, it's, it's named as such. Uh, but it's really streamlined and really easy to use. So, so those are tools and techniques for the planning phase. I'm going to move into the creative phase. This is where the, a lot of the meat of the tools are that can save you a lot of time on these projects. All right, let's see. Creative production. Get back to the basics. You don't necessarily have to use fancy things. And I'll talk about paper prototyping, back of napkin stuff shortly. Uh, online tools can also save an enormous amount of time with collaboration, as I mentioned before. The first type is wireframes and prototypes. These help quickly organize and weight information visually without needing to do heavy design work. So it's really a good idea to do this up front before you get way down the road and realize that you've got a design that nobody likes and have sunk tons and tons of hours into it. So, and it also it helps people to focus on, on different important elements that are sometimes more behind the scenes when you're looking at a design because it's easy to look at a design and want to look at the photography and the colors 
But before all that can happen, you really need to talk about the information architecture, the content organization, where your feature space is. And by pulling the design away and using a wireframe prototype, it allows you to really focus and laser in on just those elements. So it's, you know, this is as cheap and easy as it gets. Grab a napkin and make a diagram. And don't worry about it. You don't need to be fancy. Just sketch out. You know, you could be sitting at lunch. And just a wireframe test. Bang. For free. While you're eating lunch. I hope the lunch was good. All right. So that's back of napkin. Taking it one step further is taking those elements that you created on the napkin or on a piece of paper and doing paper prototypes. So you can take uh, a number of different elements and slide them around and it makes it really easy to rearrange different elements um, quickly and figure out which ones work with, with, with which others. And it's just, an, again, another low-tech way to take a look at design, uh, design and layout before you even get going with the heavy lifting. And then taking it one step further is hot glue. So this is $14 a month for small teams, and this is something that M Stoner uses internally with a lot of our clients. Once you actually have begun doing the designs, allow you to or wireframe, this allows you to collaborate right on top of the design. So instead of having kind of two places to look where you've got a design and then you've also got a whole bunch of notes over here. It lets you discuss the functionality and the context of the design instead of separately. So here's an example of what a, a typical hot glue page would look like. And you can see different elements of the screen have little note, notations on them. And when you open them up, it has a little bit of a comment. So this is just another time-saving tool during the creative phase. OK, one thing that one of my coworkers just introduced to me literally two weeks ago that I think is just a really brilliant way to, or saving time with creative review is an approach to creative review meetings uh, that really allows you to focus in on your own feelings about something without getting drowned out by the chatter. So it's, it's so simple that it actually seems obvious once you've done it. But you start the meeting with 10 minutes of silence. You have a design or designs or a wireframe uh, or some kind of creative piece and you sit there and you all look at it and you write down the notes about what you feel about it for 10 minutes. After you're done with that, it's an open, it, then it's an open forum. Now the best way to do this is to do it like an, on an online chat where everyone can kind of read everyone else's notes as they're going on, but it also works around the table. But the nice thing is that then you have five people's feedback on a particular design in 10 minutes as opposed to one person's feedback on a particular particular design in 10 minutes. So it just helps cut down on the amount of time that it takes to do uh, creative feedback meetings and also helps to figure out if people have the same reactions to things. All right. Now one thing that gets cut from the creative phase and is seen as kind of one of those ancillary things that takes too much time but is actually really, really crucial to every project is testing. So you've got all the different kinds of things that you can test. You have usability tests, information architecture tests, wireframe tests, design tests. And this is basically when you're ready to talk beyond your core team. Uh, you might, you know, you, you want to get buy-in from the rest of campus on something, um, but you don't necessarily have the time to go and talk to 100 people individually. You want to get a, a collective feedback as quickly and as, as efficiently as possible. This also gives you real results to justify your decisions which uh, can definitely CYA, which is always important. So one of the tools that you can use are surveys. Uh, I mean, most of us are probably familiar with this. They're, the efficient way to do this is to use the existing student, faculty, staff, and alumni email list that you have. Uh, one of our favorites is SurveyMonkey. Um, it's $17 a month for unlimited questions and responses, but there is a free basic service that allows you to do, uh, I think, 10 questions and 100 users. I think that's the, 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 the free service. So you could do a quick one for free um, with SurveyMonkey. Taking that a step further is Optimal Workshop. And this is another one that just recently appeared on my radar. This has got some pretty sophisticated browser-based 
testing for creative designs. You can use Optimal Sort, which is an online card sorting tool. You can use TreeJack, which is an information architecture packing tool. Uh, and we've actually used Chalkmark, which can be used for wireframes and designs to give you quick uh, ideas on heat mapping. These are a little bit more pricey, $109, $109 a month. So my suggestion uh, to help the budget would be to sign up for one month with, with, with whichever you needed. Um, and just do that month. Uh, so coincide that with the testing and then probably, um, you know, drop it after that uh, until you need it again. So the example that I have is actually with Chalkmark and using the M Stoner website, you can see it's really, really straightforward. You upload images and put in questions and, and tasks for people to do. So task one of three is where would you click if you wanted to understand what M Stoner does? And then someone goes in and they click. And then when everyone has finished the test, you have a cool heat map. So up here you can see it shows exactly where people clicked and show whoops. Oh, I think I just there we go. Shows where everyone clicked and gives you overlaid percentages of how many people clicked where. So this can be a real eye opener and a real quick way to say, hey, you know what? Like this navigation that we thought everyone was going to click on because it was really obvious and no one actually went to that. So maybe we need to rethink where that is. So that can be really, really helpful. Other testing tools that we think are extremely helpful. The Responsinator also gets credit for having the best name for a tool in this presentation. The Responsinator lets you see what your site's going to look like on multiple, multiple devices quickly. So as responsive design really becomes a more permanent uh, way of doing design. It's really the way to do web design now. Uh, having tools like this that are free available to you can be enormously time saving uh, especially and, and budget saving because who really you know can afford to buy one of every single type of device. So it's very very simple and you can't, you can't get the entire feeling just from this screenshot but it, the, you know just by default it has the iPhone, it has an imported landscape, it has tablets, it has um, a couple different Droid devices, and it's just a really, really slick and easy way to take a look and test when you uh, test how your site looks uh, responsibly. And there's just tons and tons and tons of ways to test. Uh, if you're looking to test for accessibility, Cynthia says is a great website. Uh, W3 Compliance Validator.w3.org is really good. There's a couple good page performance tools out there. Um, and don't worry, I know that I'm going through a lot of this stuff quickly, and if there's something that you would like me to go back to uh, afterward, just let me know. And um, all these links and everything are going to be provided at the end of the presentation um, along with the recording. So uh, I'm not, you know, if you're, if you're scribbling things down, um, don't worry, you'll have another chance to grab all this stuff as I move, move through it. Okay. Probably one of the biggest time sucks for any web project, big or small, is content creation and migration. It just takes a long time. It takes a long time to write things. It takes a long time to edit things. And the area that I like to focus on to try to make things lean is the consolidation of things and the root of things. Um, I find that using Google Docs in the cloud reduces the coordination time uh, considerably. So. We have used this to great effect um, by creating a Google Doc and using the bookmark, which is essentially just a hyperlink within that actual document, uh, to let people quickly jump to different pages. It eliminates a ton, a ton of emails and attachments because really, if you're the if you're the central point for collecting content and you've got like 15 content contributors and they're all sending you different versions of their documents and you're trying to collate all of them together. It can become a nightmare and just end up taking over your life. So this is, uh, I think, an elegant solution to that problem and um, extra that you've developed and kind of map that as the as the starting point. So you can see here an example, um, <coughs> excuse me, of using Google Docs with this technique. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but you can see on the left hand side you've got this column which is the map of the information architecture with the different levels for the information architecture. Then the second column is the title of each page. And then the third column doubles as a 
a due date by when the copy needs to be handed in, and also once it has been handed in, the hyperlink to uh, that part of the document that contains that copy. So you would you would jump in the same document, still same Google, Google document, to that copy, and then at the bottom of every page, return to page listing lets you jump right back. So it just it, it uses <coughs> hyperlinking to allow you to move and navigate around uh, what can be otherwise an overwhelming amount of copy um, <coughs> in, a, in a very quick manner and save yourself, save yourself tons and tons of time. All right, so that's lots and lots of stuff for creative phase time savings and making things lean. How about implementation? For implementation, the same rules apply. I mean, you want to be collaborative. You want to make sure everything's current. You want to make sure everyone can get to it and that there's only one, one place to go to get it. Um, and in, in this case, for code specifically, there's a couple of suggestions that I have. One is subversion. So if you've got more than one developer working on the same code, uh, it can get a little bit messy quickly if one person is overwriting something someone else has just worked on. So Subversion is a version control system that allows you to essentially check out code segments um, as if you were checking them out of the library so that no one else can alter them while you're working on them. Um, it does a lot more than that, but that feature alone can really save a lot of time on code rewrites. Now, I'm not a developer, but I can remember at Nazareth when we were using Subversion to do this, that it made it, that the developers we had, um, it, it eliminated a lot of the inherent feelings of panic at not knowing at what point the code was at any given time. So it's really a must-have, and subversion is a really good tool uh, for version control. And I'm going to go back to Google Docs uh, again. I'm a really big fan of Google. In case you haven't figured that out by now, but I mean, really, who can argue with them? They have they have some of the greatest uh, productivity tools out there, and they're all practically free. So it's really, really hard to argue with. Uh, okay, uh, bug tracking is one of those things that can be panic-inducing and tends to be something that list a mile long of bugs. But if you put them all in one place and you've got everybody in the same document making edits and chatting with each other at the same time, it can really help to keep everybody on the same page and uh, especially at a time when everyone is really heads down and you don't have a lot of time for meetings. So Google Docs, again, uh, saves the day in that respect. So that's a couple of implementation ideas. Lastly, let's talk about evaluation. This one may actually be easier to skip than strategy because as soon as you're done, with a project, the last thing you want to think about is the project. But the project really doesn't end when you launch. I mean, yeah, you go, you go, yeah, we finished it, time to have cake, you have the cake, everyone's really happy. But it's really, really crucial to all the prior steps in the project that you evaluate. Because all those times when you're feeling uncomfortable about not knowing how long it's going to take something for planning, um, it, that's going to be very, very helpful to have previous projects to draw upon to refine your, your estimates. So you're iterating. Each project actually iterates on the projects that happened before them, and the evaluation piece is really, really important. There's some cake. That actually makes me want to have cake now. I may do that after this presentation. All right, so it's evaluation. And the other thing to have is a project debrief. And it's really important to have this really closely following the project completion. So have cake make the second agenda item on that meeting the project debrief. Uh, do an honest assessment of how you did. Did we meet our goals? How close were our estimates? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? What didn't we see coming? And again, make that document the first thing you look at the next time you do a project like this. OK, are we tired of Google yet? Because I've got more. The other big thing that you need to make sure you're doing, and honestly, this is probably a given at this point, but Google Analytics. It's free, it's powerful, get it. It allows you to measure against past pages. There's tons and tons of options for goal setting, pathing and funnel reports, visitor behavior, uh, figuring out what types of devices people are using. 
if you have a brand new site, make sure this is installed. And if you have an old site that got upgraded, check and see what you've got for analytics before, because a lot of times it can help you to see how well you're doing with the new site. All right, so we've gone through the project life cycle, but I'm not done yet. There's an overarching set of techniques and tools which kind of apply to all of the different phases of the project. Communication and collaboration occur throughout the entire project. And so I've got some ideas for you on how to make things more lean and um, efficient in that respect as well. The general philosophy is that you're cutting out everything that is unnecessary and not skipping anything that is necessary. And I find that rule number one is get away from email as much as possible. Email is great, but it's another time suck. It's really hard to have threaded conversations in email, and if you're using a lot of these other tools, it's kind of unnecessary. So you end up getting stuck in these feedback loops where you're on a reply all thread, and it might not even be something that you're a part of, but you know what? It's human nature to want to click on it and see what it says, and how many times a day do you do that, and how much time gets wasted doing it. So um, try to stay out of email as much as possible. All right, so this is, gonna, this, is, this is dry stuff, right? Meetings, like who wants to talk about meetings? We all have to do meetings at times, and it's really, really important. It's really important to do them right so that you can be efficient with them and so that you can get a lot out of them um, and get the right thing out of them. So don't have them if you don't need them. And also don't meet to discuss stuff, meet to decide stuff. So use all these tools that we're talking about to do your evaluation and write up your thoughts on things and then come to the meeting with those ready. Don't do the evaluation and write up all your notes while you're meeting because that's not going to be as effect an effective use of everybody's time. Keep it simple and save time by getting the basics done right. Agendas, note taking, and minutes. Yes, I am actually talking about an agenda on a slide because it's important because you need to have an agenda for a meeting. You should never have a meeting without an agenda because this is what will happen. People will start talking about how good the cake was the last time you did the project. They'll start talking about the last time the sports team won was like three years ago, and you get totally derailed, and you won't do anything that you intended to do. So always have an agenda. Here's a simple template for an agenda that I use for most of my meetings. Um, just here's how to, here's the date and time, the connection method if you need it, uh, all the agenda items, uh, reviewing deliverables from the last meeting, discussing any open items, adding any new items. At the end, talking about the upcoming deliverables and who's responsible for them, upcoming milestones, and the next meeting. All right, how about meeting notes? Always take them. No, you won't remember stuff. Don't trust yourself to remember. Designate a meeting leader and a note taker. This is a really simple system that we use so that there's never any question about who's taking notes because the worst thing that you can do is assume someone else is and then you get to the end of the meeting and no one has any notes. Um, so if you got the same people at a lot of different meetings, just assign one person to write notes every time the other person is doing it. So every, I always take notes whenever Susan leaves the meeting, for instance. Susan always takes notes whenever Greg is leaving the meeting. Greg always takes notes whenever I'm leaving the meeting. All right. Minutes. Here's the trick. Copy and paste the agenda and you're halfway there. Because it's almost all the same stuff. You're going to carry it on to the next meeting. Date and time, attendance, two items, repeating the upcoming deliverables and my milestones, and scheduling the next meeting date while well, well, you have everyone's attention. This, oh, this is a really, really small but really, really important difference. It's really hard to figure out when everybody can meet when you're all at your own desks or all in your own buildings. So while you're actually at the meeting, make the very last thing you do to schedule the next meeting date because people may or may not be able to commit, but at least you're giving it a shot and you might be able to get a couple people to at least write it down as a whole. So anyway, small stuff, boring stuff, I know, but this is all the little tiny time savers that can add up to being able to ride it in a more lean way and keep you sane. All right,
and it's also something that can help to identify things before they re get really, really bad. So here's an, here's an example of part of uh, a status report. Really just things that we did this period, things for next period. Here's our original schedule that's planned. Here's the actual, here's some nice colors to tell us whether things are good or bad or almost, you know, somewhere in between. Here's how far we are uh, completing things. And here's the status, uh, you know, little notes here. So again, just, I like grids. I like simple grids. I feel like they convey a lot of good information. This is another example of a document that can really help with that. All right. How about collaboration tools? Three guesses what I'm about to talk about. Yes. Google. Google Calendar this time. I find Google Calendar to be extremely useful. It's probably the best calendaring tool I've ever had. Uh, the nicest thing about it is the find the time tool, or the find the time feature, I should say, which allows you to figure out when five, when five people actually have an hour free on a Tuesday. Uh, the one thing about Google Calendar that I know is tricky because not everybody uses Google, and there's lots of different calendaring solutions out there, and one of the complaints is that you can't share it out with people who are outside of uh, your group. And that's actually not true. There's a way to make your calendar public and you can either make it completely public and show them every detail or simply give somebody uh, who doesn't have a Google account uh, the times that you're busy. Um, so it's actually pretty friendly uh, even when you're not all on Google. Uh, and it's free and it's great. And here an example of the find the time. So you got five people's calendars all online, nice visual, way, way easy to get figure out who's going to be doing what. And it just cuts down on tons and tons of back and forth. Another thing that we like at M Stoner are Google Hangouts. This is when in-person meetings are possible, but you really need to talk to somebody uh, and can't just do uh, an exchange otherwise. So Google Hangouts are a great way uh, to connect people who are remotely located and they have a lot of cool tools too. So there's screen sharing. So it's, it's similar, although not as robust as what I'm doing right now with GoToMeeting talking to you. Um, you, can, you can share your screen. There's a, a side chat option. Uh, you can bring in documents from Google Documents, collaboratively edit them, chat about them, see each other, smiling about chatting about them, all together. It's crazy. It's like this huge ecosystem. Yes, I've, I, I've drunk the Google Kool-Aid, and it is good. All right, it is also free, like everything else. Here I am having a hangout with just me, which is kind of actually a little bit depressing. But normally you would have a couple more people here. Uh, and any of you who have watched Higher Ed Live uh, will be able to see you know, the, the three or four or five people who uh, are in this bottom row here. Um, but yes, that's Google Hangouts, a very, very useful tool. OK. You need a way to kind of pull all this stuff together, a one central place for all your communications to take uh, correspondence to reside um, for, uh, for reference later on. Because honestly, not many projects start and end with the same group of people. So you need some way to midstream. So Basecamp is our project management tool of choice. I really love Basecamp. Um, project correspondence, files, agendas, notes, conversations, project calendar, all that stuff's contained in there. And it's relatively cheap, $20 a month for 10 active projects at a time. Here's an example of the Basecamp dashboard. Pretty straightforward. And people who aren't in Basecamp can still receive Basecamp messages via email. Not preferable, but nice. Um, nice because some people simply will never log into it. All right. So that was a lot, a lot of tools, a lot of ideas. How do we bring it all together? Well, we've been doing a lot of thinking about this at M Stoner and how we can be more adept at tailoring, uh, tailoring solutions for small projects. So we have, a, we have an idea, a lean platform for small projects. Many of you have expressed that you love an approach that is the right fit for these types of projects. And so we have taken a look at what we do and created a new approach that is focused and nimble and uses WordPress. We really like WordPress because it's a powerful platform, but mainly because it's very, very easy to use. It gets out of your way. It's lean. It doesn't take too much time to implement. 
and it also has one one of, if not the industry standard, best uh, interfaces for or, sorry most usable interfaces out there. Um, it also lets us do some things that shave time off the project timeline uh, with par parallel production of design and content. So WordPress is a really good solution. It's got it's got a lot of functionality out of the gates. Um, a really, really strong development community with a variety of plugins and frameworks that you can use to customize things. And so we really feel like the WordPress, WordPress platform is a good fit for departments and schools with smaller web teams um, that need a CMS size for them. So there's other CMSs out there that are definitely a good fit for institutional web relaunches. Uh, you know, WordPress, for example, probably should be used for uh, a statewide, you know, university that has 25,000 students and 150 administrators, but there's a lot of cases where that's not what you really need. Your small team or an individual who just needs something that's going to work for you and be the right size. So, uh, using a lot of the tools, techniques, and strategies that you've seen today, we've come up with a process, and with WordPress, we've come up with a process that we feel is uh, essentially a lean CMS implementation. Uh, the estimated time to complete is about five to six months. Uh, we are able to parallel track some of the things in creative, such as copywriting uh, and copy migration, content migration, along with uh, the designs. So we can stack some things on top of each other to shave time there. And it's tailored for smaller projects and smaller teams. Uh, here's an example of the lean timeline that we plan to use with WordPress. Uh, you can see it's about a five and a half to six month um, time frame and that last month is, you know, we always do like a uh, one month of support to follow all of our projects and so it's actually about seven months total engagement uh, with you guys. So uh, just to throw that out there that this is an approach that we developed. It's available. Um, we're flexible as always. We can customize this. A uh, particular approach for you, we can come up with a customized approach as well if this is an, an exact fit. Um, if you guys are interested, just let us know. Uh, we work with tons and tons of other schools and we'd love to work with you. All right, thank you very much. And I think I've left myself 11 and a half minutes for questions and answers. I think our clocks show a different time because I've got. Seven on me, but oh, uh, I am, either I actually, way. Uh, yeah. All right. No, I did quick math. I did my math wrong there. <laughs> you know, Fran, it's it's okay. There are tools for doing math. There yeah, there's also tools for that. They... <laughs> yes. I like tools. Hey, so actually, kind of uh, off the cuff here, if you work with people in different time zones, I did not include this. There is a really, really good uh, <laughs> time uh, time syncing tool which I will share as part of the follow-up slide deck that helps me to keep sane and, and not schedule meetings at like 2 in the morning in Europe. So just to throw that out there. I clearly need it since I can't do, do my basic math. So thanks, Mallory. <laughs> uh, you know, I could really get help with that, uh, the time zone tool. So I look forward to getting that from you. Uh, Fran, this webinar was awesome. Uh, really, really into hearing about all these tools. I'll be honest, I didn't know half of these existed. So I've got a, a piece of paper that's got, uh, you know, just filled with notes. Um, so I'm sure that I'm not the only one. This is great. And I see that some questions are coming in. But uh, while people are sending in their questions, I have to share a couple of my favorite tweets. The first one was from Tanya Oaks. Smith, she said, I could kiss the blocky for what he just said about skipping strategy for small teams. Hint, don't. And I'm wondering if she means that she's not going to kiss you or that you shouldn't be skipping the strategy or both, but I really liked that tweet. <laughs> and my other one from uh, Todd, I think it's Todd Pousley. I hope I said that right. He uh, tweeted, the folks in my office think I'm having a secret meeting with myself right now. So <laughs> he's, he's scheduled that out for uh, attending your webinar. So that was pretty great. All right. So <laughs> let's get into the questions. We've got about yeah. five minutes. Uh, Paige has sent in a couple questions. And so we'll take a look at the first one. She says, um, 
We're looking at moving our whole site to a new content management system in that they prefer open source. They've narrowed it down to Joomla, Drupal, and WordPress, but their ITS group is concerned about security with WordPress. What are your thoughts on that? And I think I'm going to quickly say, Paige, if you could send me a message, is this your whole institution site, or is this just a department or college within a larger institution? So if you could chat me that, I'll update Fran um, with that information. Uh, and she says whole institution. So it's for a small college, but it's their entire institution site. That is a really good question. And in fact, I, you know, I'm not an information security expert, and I'm, I think it's something that I'd like to follow up with in more detail. I, um, okay. I know there's a lot of places that do use WordPress and are very comfortable with the level of security that, that they offer. I know that um, you know there's two there's actually two flavors of WordPress and, and this is is kind of a common um, confusion. There's WordPress.com and WordPress.org. So there's the site where you can go and start your own blog, which all of which is hosted on the WordPress servers themselves. And then there's also um, the WordPress as a content management system, which can be uh, installed and configured on your on your server. So that's that is a question probably best left to some of our technical folks. And so I will I will ping them and we will follow up with that. Cool. Uh, is that an answer you could put up on the blog with your uh, post and your slides? Yes. Absolutely. Cool. All right, Paige. So take a look at the blog. And you know what, Paige? We'll just email you that answer too specifically, but it will be up on our blog as well. So her second question is that she's looking for sample RFPs for a site rebuild. Um, do we have any we can share? Does anybody on this uh, go to webinar have any that they can share? Are there good resources online? Um, Paige, I think I can answer that. I think that I do have a few I can share with you. Um, I'll scrub them though. So uh, the institution's names are not in the document. But um, if anybody else has on this webinar has sample RFPs to share with Paige, pass them over to me, mallory.wood at mstoner.com, and I'll make sure that Paige gets those. Fran, did you have anything to add to that? No. That answer is good. All right, cool. So we do have a question from Twitter as well. Todd uh, asks, how do you objectively separate needs from wants and wishes that others might consider to be needs? Well, Todd, if you're if you're if it's only you at the meeting, you can just decide for yourself. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so you, <laughs> uh, so no, that that is tricky. So, and that's why you have you know you have to have that conversation with everybody and kind of collectively decide what you know your wants and needs are. I mean. I would say that I, I would say it's probably not about what you consider to be a need and what you consider to be a want, but what you know the people who will ultimately use the site want. So you know, put users first and say, okay, do users really need this amazing like animated GIF of a guy in a bicycle? Even though we all think it's totally <laughs> awesome, probably not. So you know, that that would be my answer: is put the users first and separate that from your own personal wishes and desires, uh, which I know can be difficult. Unless you so are going to be one of users. And then it, yeah, there you go. You're good to go. Go ahead. What if, you know, so there's higher ups or the president is saying that something is uh, a need but, um, well, maybe, maybe the president's a bad example because then I guess your answer could be, well, maybe he could just free up the budget to do it. But uh, what if, you know, what if <laughs> right. there's a director in another department or, um, you know, somebody who's on the president's council who's saying that there's a need, um, but the reality is the budget doesn't exist and it's falling more into that want-wish category. Do you have any suggestions on that? That's a tough one. I mean, if the president comes knocking and says, I really like this thing and I want it, it can be tough to make the argument if you don't have have the precedent and you don't have the metrics. So one of the reasons why it's so important to come up with measurable goals, measure them, and then do a debrief, and also to use analytics um, like Google Analytics is because you can have some, you know, objective, um, quantitative research and ammunition per se. Um, to take to that meeting to say, okay, you know, I really think, you know, I know you think this is a good idea, um, but not I, but all of these people who, who, you know, filled out this survey and gave us the results, 
all those people being everyone that goes to the school plus all the alumni plus et cetera et cetera. So that's why testing testing is more more than just useful for the the task at hand. It's also very much a tool when you get into those conversations with higher ups uh, to justify the direction that you've taken um, and to kind of politely counter point them um, in a way that isn't just, hey, I think your opinion's wrong, but, you know, hey, like we've looked at the research, you know, that's a really good idea, but we've looked at the research and, um, you know, it shows this and this and this. It's not always going to work. You might still get overruled, but at least that lets you make the case um, and do diligence. Cool. And we are a little over three, but there's one more question, so I'm going to throw it out sure. there anyway. Um, this one's from Sarah. She's asking, uh, or she's commenting that the Google products do seem great, and certainly, you know, you mentioned them throughout the presentation. Do many universities use Google products often? She's saying that they don't push them because her institution doesn't support them. Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. I and okay, another uh, dirty little secret, um, and I won't even name the institution, is that. I actually started using Google Apps and Google Docs as kind of a rogue thing um, because I found them so much more useful than what we were using institutionally. I'm not saying you should totally go against what your institution's doing, but one thing that you can do is pilot that pilot something out because because of the fact that it's free, uh, you can pilot it out with a group on a specific project, and then take the you know kind of take the success of that and the findings of that and try to get um, more people to use it. And so I was able to take that from kind of a small project team and eventually get the entire division using it, um, actually at which point the, the uh, campus IT decided to go ahead and adopt Google Apps, um, which was just kind of a coincidence, actually. It had nothing to do with what we were doing. They, had, they actually didn't know that we were doing uh, Google Apps at the time. Um, but as far as how many... just take the credit for it. Yeah, I should probably <laughs> just take the credit for it. But, um, <laughs> but you know... Um, I think I think there's a lot of places that are doing it. I think there's a lot of places that are kind of mired in a lot of uh, legacy, uh, you know, mainframe on, um, and, and you know they're in contracts for a couple of different years. There's definitely I've heard arguments to the effect that well we don't want to ship out a lot of our you know, information um, out onto the cloud and out onto Google, and it's definitely a valid point. You should you should do diligence there as well to, you know, make sure that your information is secure. But my argument was always like, yeah, let's keep the secure information uh, on campus, like student accounts and stuff like that on these other systems. But honestly, if anyone's really trying to hack my meeting schedule and figure out what the agendas are, more power to them. I mean, like, most people don't want my agendas <laughs> even if they're attending the meetings. <laughs> if this is somebody, yeah, like, some outside force that's trying to get this information, then let them. So. Um, you know, some common sense there too. So I would say, you know, Google is, the Google Apps platform is awesome. It's not the only platform out there. It just happens to be the uh, only platform that as, it is free and as robust as it is. And I just keep adding to it. Um, and I, I just keep finding myself using more and more of the stuff that they've got. Sweet. Fran, thanks so much. This has been really interesting and uh, lots of people are tweeting and saying thank you and you know, this has just been great. So thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone who attended today. Thanks for your time for attending this webinar and I hope that it was useful and interesting to you. Uh, there will be a really short survey after you log out and it's just so helpful to us if you fill it out and, and really think about it because it's great feedback for Fran, it's great feedback for us as we plan out the rest of the webinars for the year and uh, you know it's, it's well worth your time. So thanks again and you'll want to watch your email in a couple of days you're going to get a link to this webinar archive as well as a sign up link for Susan Evans webinar next month on uh, more web strategy. So thanks again and Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.